Recently, I have run into the dilemma in K-pop that a lot of albums don't feel like complete bodies of work. K-pop is not my first foray into music. I've been listening to music for like over 16, 17 years of my life. And one difference that I noticed in K-pop compared to Western pop and hip hop is that a lot of K-pop albums, whether it be mini albums or full length albums, don't typically have intros, interludes, or outros. Now I say typically because there are plenty of groups who do it. I will be talking about two of the groups that instantly come to mind for me, but another group would be like BTS, for example. They commonly add skits or interludes or outros to a lot of their albums. K-pop certainly uses intros and interludes and outros, but not nearly as often as the Western artists that I listen to. While I may touch on interludes and outros a little bit in this video, I do want to dive in specifically why intros matter so much to albums. But before I do that, I do want to hypothesize why they aren't as common in K-pop. And the most prominent answer to me seems to be the time frame of releases. Most K-pop artists take about a five to six to seven month break in between their releases. This is mainly due to promotions, whether it be variety show content, actual live performances, tours, or the company actually giving them a break, even though that's very rare. And specifically in idol group music, about 80% of the time they're coming back, it's not a full-length album. It typically tends to be a single album or an EP, which has four to five songs on it. And a lot of these releases nowadays feel very rushed and thrown together. I can only pick out around three to four EPs I've listened to this year in K-pop that I think are actually like well-made products. Like the production team sat down for a long time and actually planned this release. They don't feel like a bunch of songs thrown onto an EP to release to the public. I think most of the time intros and interludes are cut out of these EPs because as I'll explain, intros and interludes really tie the album together thematically. And a lot of these companies are going into releasing these projects with really no deep thematics in mind, maybe some very surface level like storylines and themes, but nothing incredibly deep. So having an intro is pretty counterintuitive in that case when you can just use your title track as the intro to the album. This is something I see a lot with some of the bigger groups under the big three specifically. Like I went through all of JYP and YG and SM and there were only a few instances where I could see intros or interludes being used. Like for example, Espa on their first uh, album or like their first mini album, Savage, they have a song called Energy, which is like kind of an intro song but that's like the closest thing i could find and that's like a two and a half minute like actual song on its own it's not really an intro but it's just the closest thing i could think of because it, it does kind of introduce you to some of the sounds you're going to hear on the album i check with some bigger jyp groups like stray kids doesn't really do it i didn't really see twice do it this doesn't mean that the albums themselves are bad by any means formula of love is one of my favorite k-pop albums of all time but it doesn't feature really an intro or a real interlude or a real outro uh, that's just a good album not every single album needs one of these uh, i'm not trying to say that they do but albums that tend to stick with me personally are albums that feature intros, interludes, outros that really hold together the album. So let's talk about the two groups that have really used intros to their advantage. They also do them in different ways, and that's Le Seraphim and Dreamcatcher. Le Seraphim uses intros with actual lyricism to them. There is actual speaking in their intros, while Dreamcatcher is purely instrumental. First, I want to take a look at Le Seraphim because theirs is a really good example of thematically tying together an actual trilogy of albums. The first three releases from Le Seraphim seem to be somewhat of a trilogy. That's mainly because at the end of Fearless and Anti-Fragile, we saw messages at the end of those MVs teasing the next subsequent comeback, but with Unforgiven, we didn't see anything, which has people to believe that Unforgiven is the last of this miniseries. Unforgiven is also their first studio album that features 13 tracks, six of which being previous tracks from their debut and their first comeback, including the intros from those first two releases. The first intro is called The World Is My Oyster, which kicked off their debut EP. The World Is My Oyster feels very cyberpunk. 
And the lyrics in this intro talk about a flawed world attempting to change them, but they want to take up the challenge of becoming strong and becoming fearless, and that's kind of the whole message of the entire EP. I think this intro really works well for their debut, mainly because they also released this with a companion MV, which was slightly longer and boasted slightly different instrumentals, but really sold the viewer on Le Seraphim as a concept and as a group. The name of the group Le Seraphim is an anagram for I'm Fearless, and after watching the corresponding documentary that Hybe dropped in creation of this group, it was set in stone from the beginning that this group was going to be about being fearless overcoming the challenges that the idol industry has thrown at them. Thus, the title The World Is My Oyster works in tandem with this concept. Also, the title The World Is My Oyster really sets up the EP musically. There are four different tracks on this EP besides the intro, that being Fearless, Blue Flame, The Great Mermaid, and Sour Grapes and each one toys with a new genre in some sort of way. Fearless is much more of a deeper dance pop track. Blue Flame is a lighter dance pop track. The Great Mermaid toys with cyberpunk and hyperpop elements, and Sour Grapes is much more of an R&B song, which is why this debut EP to me was so memorable, because these tracks are really good, especially the three B-sides, Blue Flame, The Great Mermaid, and Sour Grapes, which are probably three of their best B-sides in their discography, and the intro really sets up the entire body of work and it makes it feel complete. I'm not the biggest fan of the lead track Fearless, I think it's probably the worst out of their three main title tracks, but as a complete project, it is what I want out of a debut. There is a defined concept here. Do you think I'm fragile? Moving on to their first comeback being Anti-Fragile, which honestly boasts my favorite album cover they've put out so far because of the symbolism behind it. The album art references the Japanese art of Kintsugi, which is putting broken pottery back together with gold. By embracing the imperfections, you end up creating what is a much more beautiful piece of art than the original pottery would have been. And because of this, it's one of my favorite album arts in the last year. Even if it is really simplistic, I still really like it. The intro on Anti Fragile is called The Hydra. Now, before we get into the Hydra, I will admit that this EP is slightly worse to me than their debut. Impurities is a great song, but the rest of the tracks on here just don't really capture my attention, and I also think there is less musical diversity on this EP compared to their debut. I will say the title track, Anti-Fragile, is probably their best song of all time. It is one of my favorite K-pop songs of all time. I still listen to it frequently today. I do like how they try to experiment with some new flavors here, like Impurities is much more of a softer R&B song with some lo-fi influences. Is. No Celestial is closer to like a Disney teen rock song, which is something we hadn't heard from them. And then Good Parts is kind of a pop ballad piece. They're fine songs, but they don't stand out to me like the debut B-sides, like Sour Grapes and Blue Flame. But getting back to the Hydra, lyrically the Hydra is a direct parallel to Kintsugi art. Lyrics such as, falling while dancing, don't hide your mistakes or failures. I'm not afraid of storms for I'm learning how to sail my ship. These lyrics convey what the album art is talking about, the art of taking imperfections and using them to bolster a more beautiful piece of art. Sonically, the intro also does this as well. The Hydra plays with some of the cyberpunk themes that we heard from The World Is My Oyster, but adds in some newer elements as well. A little under 30 seconds into the song, they completely change the key and play with these little synth snares that kind of bounce throughout the lyrics, and they repeat this again later in the song, switching between this and the kind of deeper cyberpunk. And I think this also reflects the theme of Kintsugi art, right? Like this completely new element of music that they're adding into this intro compared to their first intro, The World Is My Oyster. It's like they're adding the gold into the art to make the intro itself feel more beautiful than the original. Maybe that wasn't the intention and it was just a completely different production choice, but I feel like that was really smart by them. I also think the Hydra with its repeating anti-fragile lyrics directly going into anti-fragile is a great setup for the song. And 
and it also provides a great performance element for them. Le Seraphim's intros tend to also be performed whenever they're at like award shows, and they end up acting as great set pieces, especially a lot of the choreo they did with some of these intros. And finally, with their studio release, they had Burn the Bridge, which I will fully admit is kind of removed from the title track, Unforgiven. Like, the instrumental to this song really does not sound anything like Unforgiven, besides the fact that they both use guitars, but they sound completely different. The lyrics of Burn the Bridge mainly talk about breaking away, following a path that may not be destined for you, but one that you decided to choose. And essentially, the message of being unforgiven talks more about not needing someone's forgiveness, not really caring what others think about our decisions, especially in what path we take in life. And that's essentially what the message of Unforgiven and Burn the Bridge is. Now, does that thematically connect to the individual songs on here and the album cover? Kind of. The album cover for this comeback specifically may go down as one of the ugliest of all time. The marks on the album covers are meant to resemble burn marks, but of course people took it another way. And thematically connecting to the songs, some of it can be felt on some choice lyrics and some of these b-sides, but it doesn't really feel like the ultimate connection between the other comebacks that you would want. It almost feels as if this intro, especially the MV, is its own separated thing, and the rest of the B-sides on this album just feel like they have to be there to be there. If anything, the intro itself feels like the conclusion to this trilogy, and that's mainly because Unforgiven as a song is kind of a letdown compared to their previous comeback. I'm someone who actually likes Unforgiven a lot more now as a song, but I can understand why people think it's a little bit disappointing compared to Anti-Fragile. And again, we're kind of assuming this is a trilogy. Maybe it keeps going, but we're assuming this because there was no text at the end of Unforgiven, so there may not be a follow-up to this. It's also evident in the fact that this album is somewhat anthological, right? Like, it has b-sides and intros from all their previous comebacks on one project. There's only really seven new songs here, which makes it feel like a conclusion to a story, and I don't really know if that conclusion is hit all that well. I will say Burn the Bridge instrumentally is my favorite of the three. I love it. The blending of the natural guitar here and the chanting is fantastic. If the other two intros were there to somewhat instill you with a small amount of intimidation and curiosity, this intro is deliberately trying to drag you into the story that is Le Seraphim. And cinematically, it's gorgeous. Like, the video they drop with this is amazing makes the other two intro videos look incredibly quaint, like The World Is My Oyster was just a bunch of b-roll thrown together. The Hydra turned into literally a runway show at the end, but Burn the Bridge instilled the wider fan base with so much hype when this dropped. And there is some like genuinely good CGI, not even just like good K-pop CGI, but like like good cinematic CGI. And if it's one thing that will always hook me with an instrumental, it is a fast snare buildup, like a Sonic song. There's just something about a really high tempo snare that builds hype in a song. And when the instrumental comes to this large finale, when they're like running on the beach and it match cuts to them running in a different set with all these really quick cutting shots, it looks so gorgeous cinematically. And that's kind of the problem. This trailer almost provided too much hype for the actual song release. Unforgiven ended up being a completely fine song. Like, I think it's a decent Les Seraphim song, and I think the Wild West concept is done about as well as you probably could, but the trailer itself almost feels more hype than the actual release of the comeback. However, Burn the Bridge does sound like the most complete intro here, and I think that intros throughout music, 
an artist's discography should also evolve like their music does. They could have gone back to the cyberpunk elements that they've used on the previous couple of intros, but here it's completely different. And I think because of its slightly longer length, it also adds somewhat of an interlude aspect to the larger studio album. Overall, Le Seraphim's intros provide a thematic tie to the albums, not only through album art, but through the music and even the experimentation on the albums themselves. An intro that you can have on an album and drop before the full release also builds hype for the album. They've done it for every single comeback now, and it works incredibly well. And having lyricism and telling a story that will be expanded further into the album is paramount to tying that intro into the rest of the content. So because of this, Le Seraphim's projects feel a lot more well-rounded and complete because they have that thematic element that ties the whole album together. Le Seraphim debuting had a very strong concept that they have followed their entire career thus far, and that's kind of one leg up that they had on their competition. Some of their other fellow rookie groups were still trying to figure themselves out conceptually. Le Seraphim had it from the get-go. And maybe people won't give the intros the flowers they deserve, but I think they do play a big role in that, right? Especially since they are the first thing we see with a new comeback. We got the teaser photos for the Unforgiven comeback, and then we got this trailer, and people were like, oh my god, this is going to be the best thing ever made. Unforgiven certainly was not the best thing ever made, but it was still a pretty decent comeback and very successful for them. Even with that ugly album art, it sold well over a million copies. So we've been talking about Le from for a while, so let's switch over to the other group I wanted to talk about, that being Dreamcatcher, who use their intros in a slightly different way. We'll also briefly be touching on interludes, because Dreamcatcher also uses those on their two full-length albums. Dreamcatcher are a high-concept group. They have this kind of horror theme to their music, this creepiness, this edge with the rock sound. It's incredibly niche in K-pop. They're really one of only a few groups to do it, and they're the one group that has really pioneered it. And I say that strongly. I do think Dreamcatcher has pioneered that sound in K-pop. There are a few other groups before them that dabbled in it, but Dreamcatcher made it their thing, and it actually has been successful for them, even if it did take some time to catch on. With Dreamcatcher, their music kind of has to have good instrumentals because a lot of the power behind rock music is through the guitars, through the instrumentals. So Dreamcatcher throws an intro on every single one of their Korean releases, including their Japanese full-length album. The team behind Dreamcatcher is dedicated to letting you know how a project is going to sound before you actually get into the project. Take their very first intro, Welcome to Dream, on their debut Chase Me. There is creepy choir chants, violins, a deep rock guitar. When you hear this, you're like, oh shit. Sounds like you're about to fight a Doom boss or square off with Cell in Dragon Ball Z. Like, it sounds intimidating. And I imagine the ex-Minx fans who kind of came over to Dreamcatcher from that group were not expecting that concept switch. The following intro on the EP, Fall Asleep in the Mirror, which was their first comeback, is vastly different than Welcome to Dream. Like, the guitar riff in this song, by the way, goes crazy. Whoever was playing the guitar, shout out to you. Seriously, the guitar riff in this reminds me of their final fight between Goku, Frieza, and Jiren in Dragon Ball Super. Like, they sound almost identical. <laughs> On prequel, their following EP, they have Before and After, which sounds, again, vastly different than the previous intro. 
every single one of these intros sets up the sound of the EP, right? Before and after sounds a little bit more lighthearted with more synths because Fly High sounds very different than Good Night and Chase Me. But then, with the end of Nightmare, that intro kicked off a trend of actually using instrumentals in the title tracks in the intro. So you'd be listening to the intro, and you would hear part of that riff, but you didn't actually know that guitar riff was in PD because you hadn't listened to the song yet. And then we get to PD, and you hear that guitar riff, you're like, oh, that's that. And it, it adds this literal, tangible connection between the intro and the title track. Not a thematic connection, but like an actual, like, objective connection. On Tree of Language, their first full-length album, we actually see an outro from them, which is actually pretty calm compared to the intro, which the intro has one of the most beautiful piano sections in a K-pop song I have ever heard. Like, listen to this. Having an outro like this adds another dimension to the album. It really makes it feel like a complete body of work. Like, I got to chapter one, and now I'm at the last chapter of the book, right? The first time we see them use an interlude is on their second full-length album, Apocalypse Save Us, which is called Skit the Seven Doors, which ties the top half and the bottom half of the album together. This is a 14-track long album. The first half is kind of like a mini-album. It has an intro, it has a few b-sides, and then it has the main track, Maison. Then you have this Skit the Seven Doors, which then leads you into the seven solo songs that the members writ individually. The Seven Doors thus being the seven different solo songs. I kind of wish this album had an outro, but I think taking the concept of giving each member a solo song and doing it in this fashion is smart because it doesn't just make it feel like you threw a bunch of solos onto an album and just called it a day you actually added a somewhat thematic element that ties those solo songs to the rest of the album Dreamcatcher essentially uses their intros as tone setters for the rest of their EP or their album, etc. I also think these intros are just a great way to show off what the production team is capable of, especially when it's just a pure instrumental intro and not a lyrically based intro. And I love seeing how the producers incorporate little tidbits from the actual title track into a lot of these intros they have. I'll play a short segment of my personal favorite moments from their different intros off their different EPs. I made an entire playlist just with their intros because I love the instrumentation on these. So take a listen at some of my favorite moments from their intros.
Now, I can't expect every single company, every single group to have an intro to their albums, right? Because sometimes groups and companies just put out albums that don't really have a deep thematical ties or a cohesive structure. Like some albums are literally just a bunch of B-sides and a title track they threw on an album and said, here, we want to sell a ton of copies to fans. They'll buy it up because we know they have a dedicated fandom. To me, a blank album is like a canvas and the songs that are put on it are the different strokes of that paintbrush. And to me, intros and skits or interludes and outros are the way that you blend all of those elements together. To me, an intro is like the top and bottom piece of bread when eating a sandwich. It's the thing that literally keeps the entire album together because it's introducing you to the themes of the album. That's what an intro is doing. It's an intro to the album. I wish more groups in K-pop did it. And when I say groups, I mean the production teams and the companies, right? Because a lot of groups in K-pop don't really have control for their own music. But it's no coincidence that some of my favorite artists out there, like BTS, like La Seraphim and Dreamcatcher, use intros in their music to their advantage. Whether it be to promote a comeback with a trailer, to set the tone of what the rest of the album is going to sound like, or to thematically tie the entire project together. This is why intros are really important in any body of music, but especially in K-pop, an industry with plenty of high concept groups that really define themselves based on one thing, or have very predetermined looks and styles for individual comebacks. And I kind of answered this earlier, but why we don't see it more is that sometimes companies and production crews just don't really feel like an album needs it, or maybe even are just too lazy to put one on the album. An album doesn't have to have an intro to be good. In fact, most K-pop albums use their title track as an intro to the rest of the album, even if the rest of the album sounds nothing like the title track. Two of my album of the year candidates do not have intros to be heard. And that's my spiel on intros in K-pop. There needs to be more of them because I feel like when there are intros, there are more well-defined albums. But now that albums are disappearing entirely from K-pop, intros are probably not gonna get any more common Anyway, thank you for listening to my TED Talk about intros in K-pop. This is kind of a hybrid video between my normal essay content and then my newer short form content I've been doing. I wanted to find a nice hybrid in between. I knew this video was going to be a little longer because I was describing two different types of intros from two different groups. I knew it was going to take longer, so thank you for sticking around. Let me know some of your favorite intros in K-pop and if you like them or not. And I will see you guys in whatever video I come out with next.